2 Kings chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, and smote the waters. They were divided hither and thither, that they went the two over on dry ground. It came to pass, when they were gone over, Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I'm taken from you. There's only a couple moments in Scripture where God presents an open-ended question where it's basically a blank check. What do you want? I'll sign it. You write the amount. What would you do with a blank check from God? Solomon was given a blank check. What do you want? And I'll give it to you. There's a lot of things that go through my mind that I would consider asking the Lord. And it's maybe easier for us to think while reading these scriptures because we get a moment to think about it in observation of someone else's situation. But when you're... Caught off guard. You ever been caught off guard? Someone asked you something you weren't expecting that? What if you heard God ask you in prayer, what do you want? And you don't have time to map it out, plan it out. You got to give him a response in the moment. That's why it's important that you have character development because in moments where you are not prepared, who you are will come forth. And Elijah says to Elisha, what do you want? I'm leaving. My ministry is coming to a close. And Elisha says, I, I pray I want a double portion of your spirit upon me. And the reply of the prophet Elijah is interesting. He's, he admits, he acknowledges, you've asked a hard thing. It is not too hard for God but it will be difficult for you to see that fulfilled in your life. God can do it, but will you meet all the requirements to receive it? And he says, if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be so unto you. But if not, it won't be so. You got to continue to observe and follow my ministry. You cannot deviate from my steps. You cannot deviate from what I am doing. You must see the moment. You must live in that moment when I am taken from you. It came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, and it split the two asunder, one fell on one side, one on the other, and Elijah was caught up by a whirlwind into heaven. It doesn't take much for me to flinch. I'll take a little dust in the air and I'll blink. And when a chariot of fire sweeps between you, and it's bright, it's got like 10,000 KLED lumens, I, mean, I could barely see you. I feel like a deer in headlights. I don't know what a chariot of fire would be like flying past this room, falling to the ground. But somehow, some way, Elisha did not blink. He did not turn. The Bible says Elisha saw it. And he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. He took hold of his own clothes, and he tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. He went back. He stood by the banks of the Jordan River, and he took that mantle that fell from Elijah. He got it all wound up, and he towel-whipped that bad boy. 
He towel whipped that body of water and he asked this question. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten those waters, when he made that statement, the Bible says there was a response from that water. And that water splitted hither and thither and Elisha went over. I want to draw our attention to the question of verse 14. Where is the God of Elijah? Would you pray with me? Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for this weekend. I thank you for what you did last night. I thank you for what you have done this morning. And I thank you, God, for what you have done this very night in the presence of worship, God, as you begin to inhabit and dwell and live amongst your people. I give you glory. I give you honor. I give you praise. And Jesus, I pray these next few moments that you would release me to speak your divine will. I pray I do not quench the spirit. I pray pray, God, I do not deviate from your will. I pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would open up the windows of heaven and roll back the roof of this church. Jesus, I pray that you would fixate a ladder between heaven and earth and may the angels of the Lord ascend and descend upon this assembly tonight. And Lord, I pray your very presence would walk up and down these aisles and Lord, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven would you lift your hands would you lift your voice and would you shout yes come on would somebody shout yes let's clap our hands to the Lord today I stand before you not with a sermon that is carefully crafted, I come to you simply feeling a vein in the Holy Ghost and putting some scriptures down that I feel led to share with you and navigating through it. I believe the Lord wants to do a work here tonight. I am persuaded of that. Anyone believe that God has something great for you tonight? Listen, the best way to get God's attention is to give your undivided attention. Do not look and get distracted or sidetracked by anything else in this room. Give God your focus. If you are watching online, the best thing you can do is turn all distractions off. Do not multitask in this moment. Engage this moment. That's the best way to get God's attention is to give him your undivided divided attention someone say where is the God of Elijah I, I, I feel that that is a question that is burning in a people here tonight I don't know about you but I feel as if I have come to a point in life where I am just tired with church as usual. I know that is cliche, but I sincerely, I'm, I'm tired of just normal church. I am weary of just going through the motions. We've all have probably stated that at some point and preached it at some point and shared that at some point. But really, as time is winding down and our redemption is drawing nigh and our world sees itself going chaotic and I see hell enlarging itself, I, I really, truly, honestly am tired of just going through routine and motions. It's part of why I have tried to be obedient to the Holy Ghost the past two nights to just kind of cut and get to the chase and just speak very directly because I want to be strategic in this 11th hour. I want to be intentional in the closing chapter of this church. I do believe I am looking at that generation upon whom the ends of the world have come and I do not want to waste your time. I want to invest in somebody here that has an appetite for more than what you have experienced. 
experience because we serve a God who is limitless, who is infinite, who is eternal, immortal, the only wise God. The Bible says in Corinthians chapter 2, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love him. Is there someone in this room that loves him? That means there's things you have yet to see. There are things that you have yet to hear that God has prepared for you. And sometimes that scripture can feel as a tease because you never seem to see it and you never seem to hear it it never seems to occur but the bible says in the next verse of corinthians chapter 2 that these deeper things of god the deeper things of the spirit god has freely given them unto us we do not serve a god who is a tease the bible says jesus spoke to the disciples and he said i go to prepare a place for you that when where I am, ye may be also. And if it were not so, I would not have told you. Jesus does not tease us. And so when the Bible begins to give you promises and you are in prayer and you receive promises and in the altar you receive promises prophecy it is not God teasing you with some far-fetched myth or idea of some some sort of mythological um, thing that you hope to happen but never will happen but it just keeps you moving forward I believe that God's word that goes forth it does not return void it accomplishes what it was sent out to do where is the God of Elijah we are this Elisha generation we are this remnant generation that is remaining as we have seen our elders move on we've seen great figures and great elders that we've heard about N.A. Urshan we've heard about G.T. Haywood we've heard about Benny DeMerchant we've heard about Verbal Bean we've heard about Billy Cole we've heard about these elders and even those that not only have passed but those that walk among us great men of God people like Lee Stone King people like Vesta Mangan people like your Bishop Woodward people that we have held in high regard we look at that Elijah generation and there's something inside of us that is crying out saying I want what they have and I not only want what they have I I want to go further than they have gone. And I want to accomplish more than what has happened before. And in the process of being inspired, challenged, and convicted by their lives, what can also take place as we observe their calling and watch their calling and study their calling and learn about their calling, we can not see our own calling. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 26, see your calling. I'm thankful that we can have apostolic heroes. I'm thankful that we can have missionaries and apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists that we hold in high regard and we respect. But sometimes what begins to happen is a chasm is created and their pedestal is put to such a high regard and a high degree that we feel as if it is an untainable position for us to ever acquire it is an untainable ministry that we will ever get a hold of and it could somewhat be debilitating it can be discouraging because I don't feel I can be like that or I could accomplish that I want to encourage you yes study the ministry of others but you also need to see your call you need to see your own personal call. 
And he begins to say, as Paul speaks to the church in Corinth, look at your call and realize this. There's not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble that are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. God has chosen the base things of the world, the things that are despised. That's God's method, not our method. He chooses the things that are not to bring to not the things that are. What is God's purpose in this method where he doesn't choose the brightest crayon in the box, typically? He doesn't choose the wealthiest tycoon out there. God seems to choose the complete opposite. Not that he cannot use a wealthy person. Not that he cannot use an intellectual person. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our patriarchs, were wealthy beyond our wildest imagination. And God used them. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, their wisdom far surpassed any other in that great kingdom of Babylon they were in. God can use the educated but somehow, some way in our ability, we can get enamored in ourselves. And God says, look, I don't need ability. I simply need availability. I just need some willing, yielded vessel that will completely floor everybody. And they will not say that their intellect was what caused them to accomplish that ministry. Or their wealth is what caused them to accomplish that ministry. So God chooses the poorest of poor. God chooses the dumbest of dumb. Some say, I man. I don't know why you default to a southern accent when you think not the brightest crayon in the box. But I'm in the north, so I could do that. It's okay. God's motive is verse 29. Is that no flesh is to glory in God's presence. It is encouraging. It is inspiring. It is inviting to realize this. That God uses imperfect people to perform his perfect will. You don't need to have it all together and be just like everyone else to accomplish something for God. He just needs a willing, yielded, humble vessel that will give God all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Is there a person here tonight that wants to ensure God gets the credit for what he's about to do? You have to see your calling and not get swept up in the calling of others. Paul has to correct this. He builds this argument in chapter 1. He builds upon this argument in chapter 2. He builds upon this argument in chapter 3. Chapter 4, it keeps uh, finding this, this thread woven through the tapestry in the Corinth church. He keeps talking to them that are so caught up in Apollos and Cephas. And, and they're caught up in Simon. And they're caught up in Paul. And they're basically name dropping who their pastor is and their name dropping who their mentor is it's fun to name drop when elijah is your mentor well who's your mentor elijah i've humbly accepted the offer Nothing wrong with Elijah and nothing wrong with the desire inside of Elisha. Nothing wrong with looking up to Apollos and Cephas. But Paul began to address the problem that he saw in the church, that people were infatuated with names. They were infatuated with popular ministries. And they followed after them. They fangirled after them. You be very careful. When you start following the Bible, he goes on to say, he says, look, look, you, you have 
ten thousands of instructors, but you only have one father. And in this digital stream that we live in, and I thank God for, I thank God I can tune into YouTube and, and Truth Radio and Holy Ghost Radio and, and all these other venues to gain and listen to great, powerful, apostolic voices. But there is no greater voice in your life than the voice of your pastor. I thank God for any amount of respect that you have shown towards me and the compliments you have shown towards me. But I, I, I just want to burst your bubble for a moment and let you realize I am not a greater preacher than your pastor. I'm going to depress you. I don't pray for you. Victor Jackson's not praying for you. Lee Stone King's not, he doesn't even know your name. Snap. <laughs> but there is a minister in your life that every single day he is bringing your name and the name of your spouse and the name of your future spouse and the name of your children and the name of your grandchildren. We've got to fall in love with the voice that matters. Yes, there's voices that come through and they're significant and they are impactful, but there is no voice like the voice of your local church. There is no voice like the voice of your local pastor. Thank God. God for pastors that pray for their saints. I'm not going to visit you when you're sick. I'm not calling your name on a daily basis, but you've been blessed to have a shepherd that's going to come to your house when there's a fight breaking out. You got a pastor that's going to come and visit you when you're in that hospital. It's a problem, and it's not a new problem. It's been going on for 2,000 years and longer where people like to be enamored and followed. And so it was in the days of Elijah. There was a flock of people that followed after Elijah. But Elijah was not some diva figure to Elisha. It wasn't just a minister he admired. It was someone that he allowed to be his pastor. And then he stayed with him. And he wanted to follow in his footsteps. There's power in that. We must have that. It goes on reading in verse 1 of chapter 2 of Corinthians. The communication at this point is ongoing. He says, I want you to understand something, church. You may have a lot of great things to say about me but when I came to you I want you to remember this I did not have excellency of speech or of wisdom when I began to share the testimony of God and I have determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified I was with you in weakness. I was with you in fear. I was with you in much trembling. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We won't admit this, but it is the reality, is that we rely and lean heavily on presentation over demonstration. Preaching has turned into something more than preaching. We won't, we won't admit that, but it is a reality. Because we know there's effective and ineffective communication. And we want to effectively deliver, but in the process of pursuing the ministry, you can get lost in trying to present the most perfectly, carefully crafted sermon. With all the alliteration, with all the rhyming, with all the fun and cool points. And we can go service after service and just hear good sermons. But do we ever stop and say, you know, that was a great presentation 
But was there any demonstration? Was there any witness of the Holy Ghost? A lot of preaching about God. A lot of singing about God. But where was God? I know it's quiet in here today. But I'm trying to stoke a fire and stir something inside of us. Saying, I want more than just another presentation. I want more than just another pep rally. I really, truly, deeply want to see where is the God of Elijah. There's a balance somewhere in there because some people like to boast in the ignorance of lack of presentation and lack of preparation. So they walk up to the pulpit. Bless God, I don't need to study. I don't need to read. <laughs> they can boast in that ignorance. And I don't got a problem with it if there's a demonstration. But we could also come and have everything so perfectly prepared and in order. Everything perfect. Not one stumbling of word. Not one stutter in the sermon. Not one note flat or sharp in the song. Not one missed rhythm. No missed cue. We can have the perfect presentation. Hours of practice. Long-winded sermons. I tell people, I don't care how long you preach, as long as you pray longer than you preach. I don't care how long you lead worship, but I, I hope as much practice as we put into the worship, I hope we put that much prayer and personal consecration into it. We ought to play skillfully as unto the Lord but at the same time Lord teach my hands to war and my fingers to fight in the spirit when I'm on that piano God teach me to war in the Holy Ghost when I'm singing that solo or whether I'm in the background ultimately God I need to be in the background so Jesus you can be in the forefront so you're seen so you're heard so you're felt Where's God? Where's God in all that we are doing? And I thank God and I believe we ought to give the best presentation possible for it reflects how we value what we represent. Some people, they won't vacuum the carpet. They won't clean the bathrooms. I'm not saying you have to have a clean bathroom in your church to have revival. But there is something to be said about how you treat the natural. It reflects how you feel about the spiritual. I believe the house of God should be our best presentation as possible. But you can ultimately get lost in the presentation. And I'm not saying this about the church. You understand my spirit. I love the excellence that is here. There is a spirit and there is a truth. There's excellence. I thank God for it. But if we are not careful, unfortunately, a trend is the reason why we have certain lighting and the reason why we have to have the screens and the fog and we got to have all these moving motion graphics. I'm not against them, but if we do not take notice of it, it could simply just be a supplement for that which we do not have. We just give presentation to accommodate the feelings of the people in the room and there is no upper room in experience in the room that we are sitting in God I want the Holy Ghost God I want demonstration God I want a moving of your power (laughs) 
I preach to this generation. I want you to hear me, every young person in this room, and I know some don't have an ever-loving clue what I'm talking about, but there is a remnant in this room that something is stirring in your spirit. I remember when it happened to me, there were certain kinds of preaching I loved to listen to. Very eloquent, very perfect. Everything was just splendid and wonderful. But a moment happened where I would go and hear the perfect preacher and the perfect sermon. Nothing against them, but just something felt hollow inside of me. And then some ignorant, unlearned person I never heard of stepped into the pulpit and brought a miserable presentation. But something was in the atmosphere. And it was like Psalm 42, 7. Deep begin to call for something deep inside of you. I'm talking to someone here. You, you haven't put words to it, but I'm going to try to help you to put words to it. It's, it's that voice that you've heard when a minister comes and preaches, and you can't tell what is different, but something inside of you is like, yes, yes, what is that? And you know it wasn't the best presentation, but what it is is the spirit is mining and trying to extract the potential that's been buried in the element of your soul and deep is calling for it. I, there might only be five in this room tonight, but those are the five I'm reaching for right now because God only needs a handful of people that draw nigh unto him. God only needs an Elijah that will be a yielded vessel to stand up against 450 false people prophets and God will confirm the word with signs following I speak to your generation and I have great concern for you I have great burden because you are starting on the wrong foot in pursuing ministry that's a blanket statement it doesn't apply to everyone but in my travels the past, this April will be eight years that I've been full-time in the ministry traveling. The first half of ministry was working two jobs in the backside of South Dakota while digging out a church work. And I've continued digging it for 15 years. But God sovereignly opened a door for me to travel and preach at places while pastoring. I never handed out a card. I never sold myself. I never tried to put myself in front of people. My pastor taught against that. It was just a sovereign door that God opened. And I could tell you hundreds and hundreds of stories of just the wildest interactions at these events that have caused red flags to rise in my spirit. Questions that come from your generation that I believe are the wrong questions to ask. People come up to me and say, Brother Brown, how much do you get paid per sermon? Brother Brown, how did you get your name out there? I'm not talking like one time I've heard that, or two times, or th I'm talking about numerous times. Brother Brown, how 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 big is your church? My favorite question. I go, not big enough. Or I answer it this way. How, how many would impress you? Started preaching out and they, and all of a sudden I say, well, well, we're a church of 20. Oh. Because we have misunderstood what value is up here. When we equate this with value... Not that we do not value the ministry, but we think person on platform equates success. And we would only put someone in that platform if they have only certain amount of members at their church. It gets quiet sometimes, don't it? And we begin to have false assumptions that are damaging to you. 
Right now, currently, as I transition from, from Watertown into the next town, we, we, we average 75 people. There's more people in this room than there are in the state of South Dakota. And I'm sorry if 75 doesn't impress you, but I'm not here to impress you. And my value does not come from the amount of people in the congregation. And my value does not come from whether or not I am preaching full-time and I'm a full-time minister. Your value is found in the secret place of the Most High, abiding under the shadow of His wing of the Almighty. What is valuable is that you obey God and find your place in God. Or preaching places and, and I don't claim and believe that everybody knows me and I don't think I'm some sort of big deal but I'm not an idiot either I'm not going to play ignorant as if I don't preach places and people don't know who I am but in the beginning literally like nobody knew I, I remember going to events a youth event and and the the youth president's like all right we need we need some campers to help uh grab some chairs please and one of the, the, the dorm dads said, you heard him, pick it up, pick some chairs. Yes, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> True story. I thought I was one of the campers. I didn't say, well, uh, you don't know who I am. <laughs> talking to people or nobody even talking to me while walking through the campground. But something magical happened after I preached the sermon. People now wanted to talk to me. Why did they not want to talk to me before? My value didn't change. I didn't change. But people see this as valuable. And now they want me to pray for them. Now they, now they want me to sign their Bible. Now they, now they want to take a picture with me. You, you okay tonight? I, I thank God that you value this. But you got to be careful before this turns into an idol that you worship and serve. As I mentioned, you need, there's no greater voice that you have in your life than that of a pastor. And I'll throw this out. I don't care how popular that preacher is or that singer is. The moment they start deviating from apostolic, you need to unfollow them. If you ever hear me preach another gospel that is not a gospel, you unfollow me. The moment you hear some trash coming out of my mouth or some inappropriate picture out there, you unfollow me. A preacher is not on the same platform as God. Only God is God. And God is holy. God is pure. We worship and serve the one true. Mm. And we see these preachers and we see these ministries and all of a sudden we begin to not even realize we pursue the wrong th thing as we feel this call to more and this call to greater. And we equate a good preacher as one that's preaching events. The one that preaches conferences or camps or conventions or congress. That is a valuable preacher. Or the person that's leading worship at general conference or leading worship at youth congress or leading this great event here. We, we will we'll, we'll deify them if we're not careful. They are not more valuable than you. You've got to see your call. Stop getting caught up in Cephas. Stop getting caught up in Apollos. Stop getting caught up in Paul. Stop getting caught up in name, brand, religion. And start getting caught up in Jesus Christ and what he has called you to be. You've got to see your value. You've got to see your call. <laughs> you may not believe this, but I, this is my opinion. The most powerful people you've heard are not the ones on the general conference floor. No disrespect to them. Most powerful preacher I've heard not been on the youth congress floor. No disrespect to them. And there's been powerful people that have been on that floor. But I'm telling you, there are people that you do not know in our ranks that are powerful. 
But we'll get caught up with this figure and we'll pursue and hope that that will be us someday. And we think we're pursuing a mantle, but we're actually pursuing a platform. We're actually per pursuing popularity. People come up to me, Brother Brown, how'd you, how'd you, get, how'd you get preaching out there? I'm, I'm doing everything I can, and my pastor won't let me preach in the pulpit, and, and I don't get pulpit time, and, and I, I, I don't understand. My question to them is this, are you teaching a Bible study? Rule at the church in Watertown, no Bible study, no pulpit. Do you know the two are the same? You are opening the word of God to a soul that needs God, and you have an opportunity to reach them. So if you really are called to minister, why aren't you ministering? Why are we obsessed with this? Uh, they won't let me sing. They won't let me lead worship. Is there a nursing home in your community? They'll let you sing. Oh, is that below you? Oh, because they're not on Twitter or TikTok and they can't get your hashtag and name out there. So it doesn't really promote you. You really called to be a minstrel? Are you really called to sing and minister through music? You can go out on a street corner and sing as unto the Lord and see what the Lord begins to draw. Nobody can come to God except the Spirit draws them. But God inhabits the praise of people. And if you would bring praise to the people, the people will find God because God lives in your praise. Why do you have to sing on Sunday? Why do you have to lead worship at an event? Why not do it on Monday? Why not go to the nursing home on Friday and sing to a soul who is is closer to eternity. Uh, you don't see the fire fall and you don't see God like you'd like to see because perhaps you're pursuing something other than God. You're pursuing an ulterior motive that you may not even realize is there. Another question I'll hear after an event, preach about the call of God, and they come with tears in their eyes. <laughs> Brother Brown, I got to talk to you real fast. <laughs> you couldn't imagine what happened. Oh, my goodness. According to my calculations, I was, I was in this altar, and I was praying, and I was on a stage. I was in a stage, and it was in a stadium surrounded by thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. A microphone was in my hands. I, I have no idea. What does that mean? What do you think? <laughs> Multiple times. You know what I never hear, Brother Brown? Can you help me with this? It, it was really weird. I was praying in the altar. And I feel like I had like this vision. And I was in a house. At a dining room table. With just one person. And a Bible. Why does everyone's call of God have to be about the masses? And not about a single soul. There's an ulterior motive inside of us. And if we're not going to be diligent and see our call, we're going to pursue greatness according to numbers, fame, and popularity. But that is not greatness. Obedience is better. Obedience is better than prominence. And if you can find God and begin to say, Lord, just lead me to a soul. Let me value a soul. Let me love a soul. And I'll reach them. I don't need a paycheck. I don't need a platform. I don't need pop. 
popularity. God, I will do whatever. Could you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? You got to see your calling. And you, you need to start living like you're called. That sermon that was, that, that teaching, that session this morning, you need to start living that. Not just for the call, but just for your walk with God. But you got to develop yourself privately in prayer and Bible reading and church and, and, and your diet. It's critical. It's important. It's essential. I know I ticked some people off today. I understand that. I'm tired of vague, general, ambiguous preaching. See, carnality hates clarity. Carnality can hide in general, vague preaching. But when you start getting specific, it's like when I started naming shows at Congress, that's when people got mad. Everyone was behind me until I said The Office. I ain't got to bring it to our church. whoop de doo <laughs> The hour's too short. People are going to hell. And God's looking for a yielded, willing vessel that is tired of presentation and wants to have a move of the Holy Ghost. Is there a young person in this room? You want to see the God of Elijah? You can see the God of Elijah. But you got to start talking to God. You got to start reading about God. You got to start surrendering to God. You go ahead and, and you live your 15 minutes of prayer every now and again. You go ahead and live reading your Bible once a month here and there. And I'm praying I hope you go to heaven too. Because I believe it's possible. But it will be a struggle. You got the picture of that house? There we go. This is a picture three years ago, Hurricane Michael hitting the Gulf Coast. And you see that big old nice house right there? It's still standing. Everything else is like poof. When the hurricane was over and they saw that house, all of a sudden it stoked curiosity. Whose house is that? How did it survive? They found the person, they interviewed him. It was a retired doctor, literally in the process of retiring. And they began to ask him some questions. And he said, well, you know, I was in the process of retiring. I, I wanted a vacation home, you know, and I, that's, I wanted a place for good, right on the beautiful coast. And when I looked into getting a property there and building a home, I read the building code to have a home there. And to build a home on the coast had greater requirements than living inland. And I read through all the minimum requirements. And what was unique about this doctor is he went past the minimum requirements. He went 40 feet pilings down into the ground. So detail-oriented he became that he, he began to research the types of screws that would be used in the home. Every speck, every detail. And he even changed and altered the roof to a different level. And, and he made sure that there were no gaps and tightened down things. So no contrary wind can get into the house and pull the roof off. He said, I wanted to prepare for the big one. 
And he said, this house isn't just for me. It's for generations to come. Look, you can get that home on that shore on minimum requirements. But look at the surroundings of those who lived on minimum requirements requirements when the big storm came if the big storm did not come they'd have their house and everything would be okay and god forbid that the big one comes in your lifetime and you get to go to heaven living on minimum requirements just to barely get by to be a member in the church just a little checklist go ahead and live that way i hope we get to rejoice together on the other side of eternity but you hear this preacher in the holy ghost right now you think the past two years have been a great storm there is a greater storm that is coming against the church and you will not sustain contrary winds of doctrine on that day on minimum requirements alone God is calling us to deeper consecration God is calling you to deeper ministry deeper pursuit deeper passion deeper purpose Come on, is there somebody here? You hear the depths of God calling for the depths of your soul. <laughs> Would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voices? The day is coming. The day is coming. This may be hard for you to believe, but I'm telling you as sure as I'm standing before you today. Though we have thousands of ministers, I truly ponder how many have true apostolic authority and dominion in the spirit. You have no authority without purity. That's why you got to watch your diet. That's why some people won't preach about media in the pulpit because they have no authority in that realm. And we get so caught up with name brand preachers at big events that prophesy. I prophesy that... A hundred people were healed today of cancer. Really? Let's have a little accountability. It's easy to prophesy general vague prophecies at a conference. You know what makes me upset? I'm just venting for a moment. Cool Mr. Preacher, man, every prophecy that goes forth at a big event to another big name in the room. That's not prophecy, that's manipulation. You're trying to weasel your way into, where's the prophecy to the unknown preacher in the room? Where's the prophecy to the unknown person in that room that needs a word from God? And why does it have to be on a microphone to an audience? Why can't you just humble yourself, walk down those stairs, go to that unknown person you know nothing about, and speak a word? You either got it or you don't. We got to make sure, young people, you get a hold of the real thing. Prophecy. Is that some buzzword that we just throw out there so we can get some people to like us?
Someone say, yeah. yeah. The Bible says it like this. Clouds and wind, those who boast themselves of false gifts are like clouds and wind without rain. Posers. I want to see saying, preacher, come to a home mission church of five people and start working in your gift. You know why some preachers avoid small churches? Because you'll get caught. You go to small church, you say, oh, the Lord told me someone here has cancer. And there's three people in there. You got cancer? You got cancer? No. Hey, we don't have cancer. You're lying. You can't fake it in home missions. You can't fake it in the church plant. You get caught. You either have something in that setting because we don't got the lights. We don't got the comfy chairs. We don't got the perfect band. You need something that no other church in that community has. And that's the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost. We don't have the money. We don't have the presentation. But we got the truth, the love of God, and demonstration. That's what you need, young people. Don't get so hungry about a big church and a big name and trying to get big time paid. You got to do the work of God. You got to fall in love with what God loves and he loves souls. Would you clap your hands to the Lord? <laughs> Lift your voices. Lift your hands. You know why people think they're a big deal? It's easy to get worked up in this setting with a bunch of people on an amplified system. It's easy. This is an easy atmosphere to preach to. Any of y'all can be up here and we would have a great time. Because this is a great atmosphere. But where, what happens when you go to an atmosphere that doesn't exist? You got to create the atmosphere by the grace of God. You see preachers in the pulpit that are powerful, singers that are powerful, singing and dancing and jumping around, and we're fangirling over them. But I've been to the restaurants with them, ain't no power. It's all show and a presentation. And they're mean to that waitress. Are we really what we're claiming to be? I'm tired of playing church. I'm not attacking the church. I'm trying to reach a generation that you don't start off on the wrong foot. The ministry needs to be about purity. It needs to be about purity, not about money, not about popularity, about souls and the will of God. And this generation, I believe with all my heart, is a team-minded generation where it's not about who gets the credit. It's about God getting the glory. And revival will happen with a generation of people that don't care who gets the credit and who gets the glory. I believe there's a new generation that is rising saying this is not about me. This is about God. And I'll team up with somebody. I'll co-pastor with somebody. I'll be under somebody. I just want to see God fill somebody. I want to see God change somebody. I want to see a move of the Holy Ghost. I remember. I'm going to hurry up. I'm going to hurry up. I've been going an hour. Mm. I remember going to South Dakota. And what happens to all of us, we're all flesh. Like, I, I'm not up here pontificating like I don't struggle with pride. I struggle with pride. I'm human. I'm human. Sometimes you could think you're something because everybody's patting you on the back. Not criticizing you, not telling you the truth. Just being kind. I start thinking I'm something. I remember getting called out onto a Native American reservation. I worked at a detox center and I helped people 
in the drug treatment. I was in the fifth step where they basically tell the life story. It was like basically confession and repentance. And this lady could not see her daughter who was in hospice care, dying of cancer, a nine-year-old girl. I remember going. I don't know how I found it. It was literally out in the middle of nowhere. No reception. No, I, it was a miracle I haven't found that place. This trailer out in the middle of nowhere on a reservation. And I got there and that lady's father answered the door who was an elder. And he was not happy I was there. He did not like Christianity. He was into tradition. But I told him, your, your daughter wanted me to come and pray for your granddaughter. So he just stared me down and let me walk in. And he pointed to the room at the end of the hall, and I just walked down that hall, not knowing what to see, what to expect. But I remember walking into that room. I was not ready to see a body bloated by cancer of a child fighting to breathe as she was dying. And there was... There is no joke that can fix it. There is no well-crafted sermon that can correct it. There was no tone in my voice that would sound as if I had authority that can fix it. I had nothing. I wish I could tell you I prayed for her and God instantly healed her. But she died right after. I went home. And I was so frustrated because I realized I, I need to invest a little more and get a little more serious. Not that if I prayed 100 hours and fasted 100 days that something would have changed. I don't know. There's people that die. Jesus told them in Matthew 17, 20, and 21, you just need a little faith. You could uproot mountains and cast them out. But this comes not but by prayer and fasting. Jesus did not pray and fast when he cast out that devil. But he had a spiritual bank account that he put deposits in. And so he could walk. You ever walk into a store and you see something? You got no cash on hand, but you know what you got in the bank, and there's no hesitation to make a purchase because you have it in the bank. That's why some people are afraid to get outside of this church and actually pray for someone or witness to someone because your spiritual bank account is empty. But Jesus knew he prayed and fasted. And he had authority in the moment. And he commanded that demon to come out. And I'm determined. You can't earn salvation. But I am determined to get as close to God as I can. And remove any distraction that I can. And to make as many deposits as I can in my spiritual bank account. Because I know when you're out on the trenches, none of this matters. You either got it or you don't. Can you lift your hands? Where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of T.W. Barnes? Where is the God of Lee Stone King? Where is he in your life? You like to name drop God and you like to name drop your favorite preachers. But it's funny to me that people like to name drop Billy Cole, but they'll do so in the process of dropping what Billy Cole stood for. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. But before you get enamored with a personality 
And I'm not against you having apostolic heroes like Billy Cole, Benny DeMerchant, James Wilson. God bless Victor Jackson. God bless Joe Campitello. God bless Chris Green, Landon Gore. God bless all these apostolic role models. But you got to see your calling. I want to read a verse in closing right now. 1 Corinthians 3.21. Our problem right now as we glory in men. And he says, stop fangirling. Stop glorying in ministry personalities. If you could put those verses up, please. I want you to see this. If you keep focusing on what's theirs, we'll miss what's ours. He says, all things are yours. All things are yours. This is for you. This is a great verse. You can put this up there. I didn't give it to you, I don't think, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. The Bible says this. We have the same spirit of faith. According as it is written, I believe, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, therefore speak. That means this. We serve the same God as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Elijah, Elisha. The same God as Paul, James, Peter, John. We serve the same God. You got to start talking like they talked and praying like they pray you can have what they had you have the same God you have the same spirit you have the same truth you have the same Holy Ghost you have the same resurrection power you are a believer you can lay hands on the sick they can recover stop making a person your idol and start making Jesus your God and talk to him and believe in him and believe that he's your heavenly father and that God is for you he says go back to 1st Corinthians chapter 3 he goes on to say after verse 21 he says stop glorying in men all things are yours so stop wearing the next verse. Stop worrying about Apollos and Cephas and all these other names you're dropping out there. Stop for worrying about them and focusing on them. You belong to Jesus. You belong to Jesus. This generation, let's stand together. This generation, I believe, will see the God of Elijah. If we start on the right foot, if we start with a good motive and a pure heart, and we start seeking God out of desperation, you will see see that God mm. this generation deals with insecurity and inferiority complex a bunch of beggars just, we feel so lowly. We're not, we're not Victor Jackson, and, and we're not Drew Galloway, and we're not Chris Green, and, and we're not Lee Stone King, and we're not Bishop Woodward. We're, we're just these lowly beggars hoping just to get a crumb. But the Bible says Jesus called for a man that was calling out of desperation. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And he heard the call of Jesus, and that beggar decided to throw off his his identity and he was no longer a beggar I'm here to declare to you you are not a beggar you are a believer you are not a beggar you are a believer stop begging and looking at yourself as a lower citizen of heaven you serve the same God you have the same faith you have the same Holy Ghost we need to rise up and say God I serve you like Elijah served you I I pray to you like Elijah prayed to you. God, where are you? Lift your hands. Lift your voices.
I can start telling some stories to try to build your faith of the miraculous that I have seen. I'm not going to do that tonight, but I just want to share, say this simple point. That God has allowed my eyes to see the miraculous. God has allowed me to see the supernatural. But I've not seen everything I want to see yet. I want to see as much as possible. I want to see a great awakening in South Dakota. I want to see a rural revival sweep across South Dakota. And sweep across the surrounding states. And sweep throughout North America. I want to see greater things. I want to see greater things. But it will not come by money. And it, I thank God for people that invest but I am not going to depend on money I am not going to depend on gimmicks we need a move of the Holy Ghost because tradition is deep rooted and strong we got to break down strongholds by having a strong walk with God is there a generation in this room that wants to see revival in New Brunswick you want to see the God of Elijah I want you to come to this altar I want you to lift your hands in faith and cry out to God in desperation you can have it. You can have it. You can have it. You can have it. Come on. That's it. Lift your voice. Come on. Come on. Press your way in. Press your way into the kingdom. Press your way in. Where is the God? Where is the God of Elijah? I want to see him. I want to see him. Come on, go after it right now. I'm done. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Go after God. Go after God. You're going to see it, guys. Come on. You're going to see it. Your eyes are going to see it. Your hands are going to see it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. Therefore, I speak it. I believe it. Therefore, I decree it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe this generation is desperate. I believe this generation is hungry. I believe they're going to go after it. I believe for them to see greater things. Come on, you can see a miracle. You can see a miracle. Come on, lift your voice. Come on, pursue him. Pursue him. Pursue him. Come on, there's greater things. Come on, who's after the greater? Who wants the greater? The great I am is in this room right now. The great I am is in this room right now. You're not a beggar. You're a child of God. You're the king's favorite kid. Come on, God wants to change your mindset right now. You don't have to be someone else. Be what God called you to be. That's what God's going to use. That's what God's going to bless. That's what God has anointed. That's it, come on. Come on, push yourself in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, push yourself in the Holy Ghost right now. Come on, you're up against the wall. I want you to break through that wall right now. I want you to break through that wall right now. Push back against what's pushing you. Push back against average. Push back against normal. Push back against everyone else's expectations. Press your way, press your way, press your way in. Yes, 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 woo, it's here, it's in this room, there's demonstration in this room, come on, get a hold of it, get a hold of it.
we get caught up we're going to keep praying but listen we get caught up in chasing mantles if you've ever been at a conference or event two buzzwords that get people salivating in the altar mantles and impartation Hold on one second, sister. Hold on one second, sister. Mantles and impartation. We'll go after it. Because we want someone to transfer a gift to us. But you cannot transfer consecration. We won't say it, but we think an impartation or a mantle is a shortcut to authority and power. But there is no shortcut to consecration and getting spiritual authority. But I want you to think about this as we're going to pray. We like to chase someone else's mantle. But whose mantle did Elijah chase? Nobody's. He simply lived in his lane and in his call and he lived a life worth repeating I know we want to pray to get so and so's mantle what if you're not meant to get someone else's mantle you're meant to create a mantle of a life worth repeating that someone else wants to be like you I believe there are a number of unique mantles in this room that you can make in your consecration. I'm not against mantle preaching. I'm not against impartation preaching. It's all biblical. But where are the people that make mantles instead of trying to get me a hand-me-down? If you want to live a life worth repeating in the Holy Ghost and see the God of Elijah, would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? And you go ahead, sister. Go ahead and speak out in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead. Go ahead. Release the sound. Release the sound. Come on. In this altar, you can weave and make a mantle. In this altar, you can live a life worth repeating. You don't got to be like anyone else. You can be you. You can be you right now. You can be what God called you to be. And that's what you need to be right now. Lift your voice. I loose you in the Holy Ghost.